you're looking to dive into topics on how to live a happier, healthier, more fit, and long lifespan, then you've come to the right podcast. Living the dream with me, Coach Damian Evans. Together, we will explore the topics on all things health, fitness, and wellness. Together, we will be lifelong learners on this journey to living the ultimate dream. What up, Dream Team? Coach D here coming at you with a bite-sized brain snack. These episodes were inspired because of our obsession with snacks. We love to fuel our bodies with these little bite-sized nutritious foods, and we've also talked about adding movement snacks into your day the same way. So we have food, and we have movement covered, but what about our brains? It's time to add some little bite-sized brain snacks into your week, and that's what these episodes will be all about. Bite-sized wellness wisdom for lifelong learners. So let's open up and satiate our minds. This brain snack is all about how your shoes may be causing you chronic long-term pain. Do you deal with chronic aches and pains in your knees, your back, your neck, maybe your hips? What if I told you that all those nagging pains aren't a normal part of aging, but rather could have something to do with the shoes that you're wearing? Today we're touching on the history of modern footwear how their evolution has contributed to the society that we have with weak feet and chronic pain up the chain, and tips for what you can do to start regaining your foot strength. Now, if you'd like to go more in depth, I did an episode early on when starting this podcast called Why Foot Health is So Important, The History and Evolution of the Shoe and Our Feet. I'll include the link in the description of this episode Definitely, you should check it out if you want to go for a deeper dive. So a brief history of modern footwear. Shoes have been a part of our ancestral history for thousands of years. I just recently listened to an interview with Galid Clark, a seventh generation cobbler and descendant of the famous Clark Shoes family, also a part of the company Vivo Barefoot. He was interviewed on the Drew Pro podcast and The earliest shoes were made over 100,000 years ago. The original purposes of shoes, of course, was to protect the foot from harsh weather and terrain, and they were made from raw materials like animal hides, leaves and grass, and bark that were flexible and allowed the feet to move naturally. From ancient Greek and Roman empires to the medieval era, the Industrial Revolution, and all the way up to right now, present time. Shoes have gone from minimalist and practical to technical and specialized. They were even considered a status symbol in many cultures. In Chinese history, there was this excruciatingly painful practice out of China, of course, known as foot binding, foot binding, where it involved breaking, literally breaking and binding young girls' feet to make them look smaller and more feminine. Oh my goodness. In the process, these poor girls' feet became so weak and deformed that they were unable to move freely or walk for long distances. Dang, if you want to check out some gnarly photos, Google foot binding and just see what pops up. And if you're squeamish, definitely don't do that. Foot binding was eventually outlawed in China, and of course it's an extreme example of foot manipulation, but we are currently doing that to our own feet today, right now. You are most likely doing a form of the same thing. But it's important to understand that high heels, pointed dress shoes, and cushioned sneakers, they still persist and are providing a version of this foot binding on their own by either squishing our toes together, limiting our foot mobility in the way that it's supposed to be able to move, and manipulating our feet from their natural state in some way. What's even more confusing is that these shoes are marketed as fashionable. Despite making our feet weak and deformed, it's a fashion statement, which has downstream effects on the rest of our body. We are connected to the ground through our feet. They are our stable foundation, or at least they're supposed to be. And when there's a deficiency all the way down at the bottom of the kinetic chain, it moves up the kinetic chain to your ankles, your knees, your hips, your low back, and potentially all the way up to your neck. But since 
the pain is not super noticeable at first, many people don't assume that they're doing any long-term damage. Now that we know when modern footwear took a turn for the worse, let's talk about the why. Here are the five of the biggest issues with modern day footwear. Why are modern shoes so bad for our health and how do they contribute to our chronic pain? Well, the next five points should answer these questions for you. Number one, shoes weaken your feet. Sneakers are designed to be quote unquote comfortable. So now they have this huge arch support, which is this big cushion on the underside of your foot with thick padding, even maybe orthotics and rubber soles to aid in shock absorption, which is what your foot was designed to do. According to Galad and the other natural footwear experts, however, the foot is designed to absorb 50% of the shock in every step. By coddling our feet, our muscles and tendons aren't being used as much, and if you don't use it, you will lose it, which weakens the feet and forces our knees, hips, and back to absorb the shock. This unnatural movement can, over time, put a great deal of stress on the body and contribute to chronic pain pain. So our feet are marvels of biomechanical engineering. They have evolved to provide support, stability, and mobility to our entire body. The arches of our feet act as natural shock absorbers with each step, and the arch is supposed to flex and distribute the force evenly throughout the foot. Modern shoes often come with excessive arch support, thick padding, and cushioned insoles. So while these features may seem comfortable when you first think about why you're putting on a shoe. What they actually do is they actually weaken the muscles and tendons in our feet over time. When these support structures take over, all that work that our natural foot arches should be doing, our foot muscles become inactive and gradually weaken. I like to tell people, what would happen if you put on an oven mitt on your hand, and let's just put two oven mitts on, left and right, and then you just lived your life like that, let's say 10 hours out of the day, every day for 30, 40, 50, 60 years. What do you think your hands would look like? How strong would they be? What would you be able to do with those hands if that was how you lived your life? Weak foot muscles can lead to imbalances in the body affecting the alignment of our knees, hips, and back. And alignment is gonna be an important thing towards chronic overuse pain. This can contribute to chronic pain as the body compensates for the lack of foot strength and the lack of foot stability. So number one, shoes weaken your feet. Number two, they scrunch your toes. Pointed toe shoes force our toes into this cramped space that they're being squished and pressed on top of each other. In fact, I had a client 92 years old, one of my favorite clients of all time. His name was Doc. He was a doctor in his uh, previous career. Doc had the pinky toe and the next toe in underneath of his foot. They were growing underneath of his foot. It caused him extreme pain all the time. His balance was terrible, and it was because he put his feet in these dress shoes from his doctor's office work and working there for years and decades on end. He told me if he could do one thing differently, it would be to change the shoes that he wore all his life. Now, because they scrunch your toes, this severely limits the movement of your big toe, your great toe, and this can lead to bunions over time. And that's right. Confining your toes in modern shoes can lead to bunions. No, they're not entirely genetic like many people say and suspect. Minimalist shoes aren't a solution to bunions, but minimalist shoes, they can help reduce the pain as your foot health improves. If bunions stay the same or get the worse over time, after switching to a shoe with a wider toe box, it's a really good idea to consult with a professional for solutions because you will have to do some work to get those toes to spread back out. In fact, I was an athlete pretty much all my life. I still consider myself kind of a like a old school athlete, but I would wear basketball shoes which would crunch my toes, and even worse, soccer cleats, which were pretty much just like the male version of high heels. My toes are starting to crunch together when I'm in my early 20s. My pinky toe is starting to come underneath my second toe. I had to do something. I turned 30 years old, and I spent 
so much time doing foot strengthening exercises, uh, wearing toe spacers, yoga toe spacers while I was walking around, even in my shoes sometimes. I was just so, so self-conscious about my feet. I was so dedicated to trying to get them back to that natural toe spread and look like a normal, what a, what a human foot should look like before they get stuffed into shoes. And three to four years later, Yes, I can see a little bit of difference, but really you're trying to undo decades of work. So it's going to take work. It's going to take time. You can't just think about sliding your foot into a minimal issue and everything's going to be better. But that is a first great step. The structure of our toes is essential for maintaining proper balance and functionality. And our big toe in particular plays a crucial role in helping us push off the ground during activities like walking, running, or jumping, anything during that get natural gait cycle. Pointed toe shoes or shoes with a narrow toe box force our toes into this unnatural cramp position, and this compression can lead to a condition known as hallux valgus, commonly referred to as a bunion. Bunions are not solely genetic. They can also result from the pressure and misalignment caused by ill-fitting footwear. So don't blame your genetics. Don't just chalk it up as a loss because this is just what happens to, to people in my family. You have control. You can strengthen. While switching to shoes with a wider toe box, it can provide relief. It's important to address the root cause and consult a professional if your bunions persist or worsen. For me, my pinky toe. I had to figure out how to get that thing starting to move away from that second toe. And it takes time and it takes actual work. Not fun work either. If you ever try to do what's called piano toes, where you try to control each toe individually as you tap the piano on the floor, or if you try to lift your toes and then tap your pinky to the side, trying to strengthen the outside of your foot, you can do the same thing with your big toe. It's tedious work. It's even, it's even more boring than bicep curls. So number two, they scrunch your toes. Number three on the five of the biggest issues with modern day footwear, number three, they don't allow your big toe to pivot. So not only do they scrunch your toes, but they don't allow your big toe to pivot. Your big toe, it has a big job. That's why it's called your great toe. It helps you to grip the ground and to pivot and to shift your weight while you're walking, running, or standing. Allowing the big toe to adjust and pivot in its natural range of motion is also super important for our balance. The ability of the big toe to pivot and adapt to the ground is so essential for maintaining our balance and stability during movement that when we walk or run, our big toe should flex and push off the ground to propel us forward. But if you really, if you take off your shoes and you really concentrate on how you normally walk, I would love to know how much pressure you put through that big toe. Conventional shoes, especially with the rigid soles and the cramped toe boxes, they inhibit this natural pivot movement so we don't get that practice or that mind-to-muscle connection. And over time, this restriction can compromise our balance and lead to a less efficient gait pattern, potentially increasing the risk of injuries. Which leads us into number four, they cause balance issues. When our big toe is confined to modern shoes, it throws off our balance. And have you ever seen an older person wearing orthotic shoes, just struggling to walk, probably not even able to hold themselves up without a walker? Well, typically orthotics are used to support weak or deformed feet. However, arch support and cushioning this limits their already impaired movement. So it's like putting a Band-Aid on an already happening problem. It's like hitting your head against the wall and taking medicine to get rid of the headache, but continuing to hit your head up against the wall. This is going to lead to a greater risk of falls and fractures when it comes to your shoes. Footwear that restricts the natural movement of the big toe is going to disrupt our balance, and balance is a complex interplay between various sensory inputs in our body. It's including our proprioception, our awareness of where our body is in space, but also the feedback that is received from the feet. I'll talk about how many nerving things you have in your feet in just a second. Wearing shoes that limit toe mobility disrupts this feedback loop and can be particularly problematic for older individuals or those all with already pre-existing balance issues. Orthotic shoes designed to provide support can inadvertently exacerbate balance problems as they further restrict foot movement. But here's the issue. When 
you need an orthotic, when the doctor says you need an orthotic, it feels better and you feel like you need to have this tool. It, it, it's a short term fix, but it's not fixing the long term root cause problem. So yes, orthotics are super helpful for a lot of people. I have many clients that actually get a little defensive about like, I need this orthotic. But it's like wearing a back brace your entire life. Now you have to use that back brace in order to do anything. So it's maybe we use this tool while we need it to be safe, but maybe we work towards strengthening to where we don't need it eventually. And that takes research. That takes time. Maybe it takes searching out a fitness professional or a professional that can help you with that specific area of your body. And sometimes that's just a little bit harder and it's going to be a little bit more time investment than people are willing to do. And you just have to be honest with yourself about where you are on that spectrum. And number five, the last one, they don't allow the natural building of our own arch. Finally, we put shoes on our kids' feet at an early age, which can impact arch development. That's why the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends babies not wear shoes until they start walking. And even then, barefoot is the recommended option for optimal foot development. Barefoot as much as possible. When we spend most of our time in sneakers, our arches can't develop or become strong. What's more, some shoes and their arches are so high that they can contribute to the development of flat feet. Crazy, right? Wearing shoes with overly high arch support, even if you don't have an issue, that if you wear these arches that don't align with your natural arch, they can hinder the development and potentially lead to the flat feet that you were trying to avoid, where the arch of your foot collapses and now you have the muscles underneath your foot weak and atrophied. Man, that doesn't sound like a great situation. Here are three mind-blowing facts about the feet that also highlight how they are affected when we wear shoes or when our modern-day shoes are worn. Number one, feet have more than 200,000 nerve endings. 200,000. The feet are incredibly sensitive and are packed with an astonishing number of nerve endings. In fact, there are over 200,000 nerve endings in the soles of each foot, each these nerve endings provide essential sensory information to the brain, helping us navigate various surfaces and terrain. When we wear shoes with the thick soles and cushioning, we dull the feedback that these nerve endings can provide, and this reduced sensory input, that can affect our balance and proprioception, making it harder to maintain stability and adapt to uneven surfaces. And this is where opting for minimalist shoes or going barefoot allows those nerve endings to better transmit sensory information. Number two, feet can sweat up to half a pint per day. Whoa! Feet have a high concentration of sweat glands with approximately 250,000 sweat glands in both feet combined. This means that they can produce a significant amount of sweat up to a half a pint or about a quarter of a liter per day. When we wear shoes that don't allow for proper ventilation, such as tight-fitting, non-breathable footwear, this moisture can become trapped. The warm, damp environment inside shoes can create a breeding ground for bacteria and fungi, leading to foot odor and various skin conditions like athlete's foot. Ew, ew, ew. Yeah. Feet are dynamic shock absorbers. Number three, feet are dynamic shock absorbers. Feet are designed to absorb shock and adapt to different surfaces. The arches of the feet act like springs, flexing and releasing energy with each step. They can absorb up to 50% of the shock generated when we walk or run, which will save our joints up the kinetic chain. Many modern shoes come with excessive cushioning and arch support, which disrupts the natural shock absorbing function of the feet. And when our feet become reliant on shoe cushioning, then the muscles and the ligaments responsible for the shock absorption weaken over time and atrophy. And if we don't use it, we lose it. This can lead to a decreased ability to absorb shock, potentially contributing to joint pain and discomfort. These facts highlight the incredible complexity and adaptability of the human foot. Properly designed footwear should respect the natural functions of the feet, allowing them to maintain their sensory input, their moisture balance, and their shock-absorbing 
properties and capabilities. It's essential to choose footwear that promotes foot health and doesn't hinder these remarkable features, no matter how cool and fashionable and popular they look or are. So try this. Number one, walk barefoot more often. The first and easiest thing that you can do to start strengthening your feet is to walk barefoot. I know it sounds simple, but the act of having your bare feet make contact with the ground, using the muscles and tendons and ligaments of your feet like they're supposed to be, supporting your foot strength, your flexibility, and stronger arches is the way to go. You don't have to go far. Just start off by not wearing shoes in your home. It's crazy to me how many people still wear shoes at home instead of just walking barefoot. Not only is that better for your feet, but you're also going to keep a cleaner home. If you have a good handle on that, then you can take things up a notch by going barefoot outside when you have any opportunity to. That might mean being barefoot more often in your backyard or even at the park on the weekends. In addition to being great for your feet, you're getting the benefits of being outside and also the anti-inflammatory elements of being grounded to the earth. We've done a whole episode on the benefits of grounding. Number two, switch your uh, shoes to minimalist shoes. Minimalist shoes are super flexible. They have a wide toe box so that your toes can spread apart comfortably. They're lightweight. They have a thin sole with zero heel drop, the difference in elevation between the toe and the heel. And that's going to be an uh, opportunity for you to get all that sensory information from the ground, but still have your feet protected. Transitioning to minimalist shoes can be Challenging for some due to weak foot muscles, and, and that's going to cause pain if you go too fast, too early. And this is going to lead to possible discomfort. Maybe you're going to start to get shin splints, or maybe your foot muscles underneath your foot are going to start to cramp. So it's essential to progress gradually here, allowing your feet to strengthen and adjust, which may take a few weeks to even months. My favorite minimalist shoes are Vivo Barefoot. I've worn Vivos for over five years now. I pretty much only wear Vivos. I'm not even affiliated with the company. Uh, I have one pair of nice dress shoes for nice occasions that I only pretty much wear at weddings. I wear Chucks when I'm going uh, for like a nice jean look. So the Chucks, they have a very um, small toe box, which I don't love. So I try to use those only as much as possible. And then anytime I'm doing anything else, it's Vivo Barefoot's Primus Lights, and then it's Vivo Barefoot's Hiking Boots. Oh man, anytime I go hiking, I wear the Vivo hiking boots and they are incredible. The best hiking boots I've ever worn, definitely recommend. There are also other many other great minimalist shoes out there. I haven't really experimented with many other brands, but there are a lot. And I'm gonna include a complete list that movement specialist Katie Bowman put together. It, they have it by style, by age, by activities. This list is all-encompassing. It's incredible. It's an incredible resource. Definitely check it out before you go just to Vivos. But, I I mean, this list, I, can't, I am so impressed with what Katie did here. So look in the description of this episode for that link to a complete list of minimalist shoes. And some final thoughts here. I, I really absolutely despise wearing formal dress shoes but I love spending time with friends and family. So that's why for special occasions, I guess I'll wear some fancy shoes for the pictures and then I'll change this into something a little more comfortable to sit and chat or to dance in. And nowadays it's becoming even more common to have flip-flops for guests to change into at big events like weddings or anniversaries. And I love this trend and I hope that it becomes more mainstream. And if you're going to a wedding Talk to someone and see if you, that could be an option for you. You know you don't have to suffer in pain the entire night. You never know. You could save yourself and other guests a lot of pain if you ask this question. Also, there are really great flip-flop options that have a strap on the back so that you don't change the way that you're supposed to walk, which flip-flops sometimes change your gait because you're trying to hold that flip-flop on your foot without sliding off. So you do change your gait a little bit when you wear flip-flops. So I wear what's called Earth Runners, Earth Runners. And yeah, they are definitely a little hippy dippy. I actually call them my hippy flippies, uh, but I love them and wear them anytime that I'm walking to the beach or just around to do errands. So I say, let's normalize getting barefoot more often and limit your super cushioned shoes to just strictly when you're running. 
And that's it, my friends, for this bite-sized brain snack. Share the knowledge that you gain with your friends and family and hold each other accountable. If you enjoyed this content, it helps a ton if you could post on your social media stories a screenshot of this episode and include one takeaway that you learned. And make sure that you tag me and share your journey. Tag me at livingthedream underscore podcast or at coachdamian underscore SD. And let us know how this episode benefited you. Let us know what we missed. Let us know what we got wrong. Tell us how you may have experienced foot pain or changed your shoe style based on function instead of style. We want to know. Message us if you have any suggestions or tips that would help your Live in the Dream team that we can discuss in future episodes. I will be right here with you working on making us stronger, happier, and healthier humans. Until next time, friends, keep living the dream.